Hey there, it's Pete Thorne. Welcome to another Wednesday Q&A. This is where I answer the questions that you ask me uh, via sending me an email to my Facebook music page, which is facebook.com slash guitar nerd. Send me an email there and I will try and get your question in one of these Q&A videos. Uh, so one of the most common questions I get uh, to start off here, I've addressed it a little bit in the past. Uh, Alessandro asks, and a bunch of other people actually asked, uh, how do I do my drum tracks that are in my demo videos? Um, well, I use a couple different programs, first of all. So Steven Slade Drums uh, is the program that I mainly use. Amazing drum sound, so drum sample program, basically. Um, comes with a bunch of included grooves and a bunch of drum kits. And you can use it standalone, I believe. I always use it within Logic, which is my digital audio workstation. So you can use Steven Slade Drums if you have Pro Tools or uh, you know just about anything uh, as far as a workstation goes. Um, and you simply open it up on a software instrument track in your program, select a kit, it's got a mixer built in so you can kind of mix the kit a little bit and, uh, and then there's grooves in there that you can start with so you can take like they're like MIDI grooves, you can pull them down into your, into your uh, you know, digital audio workstation onto a track and then you can you know, change up the beats if you want a little bit, move around, kick drums or things like that, mix it up. Um, uh, one good tip is there's um, a bunch of MIDI grooves out there on the market that you can get as like third-party MIDI grooves. There's a company called Slam Tracks. They sell some really good ones. Uh, Slamtracks.com, I think, and uh, just a whole bunch of other. Uh, uh, Loop Loft, I think, has some. Um, anyway, if if you get a bunch of those and then load them in to uh, say Steven Slate drums into the groove browser area. Uh, you know, then you can uh, you have some grooves to pick from. You don't have to like program every single you know drum hit and stuff like that on like a MIDI keyboard or anything like that. Um, I program some of my grooves from scratch. Other ones are stock grooves that I start with that I've got, and then I kind of modify them for the song. Um, you know, I'll usually like have to change the kick pattern a little bit, or maybe program specific fills, or change up the feel a little bit. It's 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 all a little bit too complicated to get into in a video like this. Um, but that's a good starting place. Now there's a whole bunch of other drum programs out there that are great too. There's Addictive Drums, there's Easy Drummer, uh, there's just a couple off the top of my head. Steven Slade is the one uh, that years ago Steve Stevens recommended to me and said these things sound like real drums are just great. Um, and that's why I went that way. Um, but there's, there's other options out there that I haven't even investigated. Um, Steven's a pal of mine too. He's a, he's a, a fun guy and he's a cool, cool dude. So uh, I just stick with his because I know it and yeah, it works well for me. Uh, what else? What else? Okay, so the other thing that I do is that within Logic, I mix the drums as though they're a real drum kit. So I spread them across a bunch of faders. I've got the kick, the snare, the toms, the overheads, the room mic, all that stuff is all separate on different faders. And then you can mix all those things like you would a real kit, um, sort of you know applying EQ and compression to them as you see fit, and then send them all out one master drum bus fader, and uh, maybe use some EQ and compression and stuff like that just on that on that fader that is like drum bus compression essentially, and uh, and EQ, um, yeah, treat the drum bus essentially uh, uh, you know like it's a real drum kit, and that just goes a long way towards making it sound like real drums. If you simply just pull it up on a stereo fader and sort of roll with whatever preset, you know, there's a really great presets that come in Steven Slate drums, but I, I mix the hell out of them uh, to make them sound like real drums to me. Um, nothing wrong with what what the program comes with, but yeah, put in a little bit of time and effort and, and uh, uh, you know, learn how to, you know, use compression and EQ on, you know, the kick and the snare and the toms and the room mic separately and all that stuff. And all of a sudden it really comes to life and starts sounding like real drums. So it's a really big compliment to me when uh, and people say, you know, is that real drums on this track or did you program this or is this a guy, you know? And I love that because it's like, if they can't tell, then, you know, that's just really cool to me. I mean, ultimately, the best thing is to get in a room with real people and play, and we all know that, and I wish I could do that all the time, but when I can't do that, uh, it sure is great having these tools at our disposal these days that um, sound so cool. Uh, Flavio asks, um, he's from Italy, he asks, uh, what do I look for in a vintage Strat uh, or a custom shop reissue of any kind in terms of, of uh, sound and playability and setup? Um, well, let me grab my, my old Strat. It's right behind me. Um, 
when I got this guitar in about 2007, uh, I got it from Gruen's in Nashville, and I plugged it in against a whole bunch of other strats, like a 60, I think, and a 61, and a 63, and they were all way more money because as you get further back in the 60s and in the 50s, they just go up in price generally, unless it's like a custom color or something, and then that goes out the window. But um, this is basically almost a CBS Strat. It's a pre-CBS. It's November of 64. That's when it was made. Uh, so it's still solidly pre-CBS uh, with an L, L neck plate on it and all that L serial number. But um, yeah, it was it was you know it was still expensive, but it was like a, a more reasonable than I couldn't afford the the other ones that were like 61, 62, 63. And ironically, later on, I heard a bunch of people say their favorite strats, like guys that really know, are kind of like the 64, early 65, um, as far as the pickups go and stuff. Um, some people like Hoagie from Comet Amps, he, did, he really digs this particular era of strat, I think, uh, because of the, the, the pickups and the output of the pickups and the way they were made and stuff, I guess. But anyway, it just is a really, really resonant guitar. Um, it's got a really warm sound for a strat. Um, like it cuts, but it, it's, it's got a great tone to it and it just plays great. And I mean, it's worn it to hell, you know, whoever played it, play the crap out of it. I saw a photo of it the other day, like when I first got it and I'm amazed at how much wear I've actually put on it. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot uh, of, you know, the arm wear and stuff like that. This patch was about half this size and, uh, yeah, so I beat it up a little bit myself, but, um, you know, it just, it just has so much vibe, this guitar, I don't know. It just, it stayed in tune, it sounded good, like really good. <laughs> uh, you hear it in a lot of my videos, and it just it just has this warm, but yet that fluty sort of strat neck pickup sound. And um, and, it, and it's a good player. Um, it had been refretted when I got it by Gruens, and it had really small vintage size frets in it. So I opted to actually refret it again, uh, because I thought I'm gonna get this thing. I want to play it and I want it to be the frets that I want to use and it's been refretted once anyway So who cares? So I, I had uh, Eric at Lush Guitars here in LA do a refret on it and um, So it's got sort of 6105 size frets in it now I think which are great just nickel 6105s and it just feels like I don't know just to you know You want to pick it up and you want it to be all that like whatever that intangible strap thing is or vintage guitar thing You want it to feel like a worn in old pair of shoes and then just have all you know all the tone in the world and this this one just really works for me it really stacks up okay dave from the netherlands also asked about the drums that i use like i say it's a very common question that i get so i've already kind of addressed that um but he, he goes further and asks how i set up templates within logic in order to make my workflow sort of easier and keep the creative flow going um and he says he's, he's always struggling getting uh uh, the the drum sounds that he hears in his head and um, he gets to the point where the creative mood doesn't uh, uh, well he says how do you get keep the creative mood from getting distorted you know from doing like hours of tweaking drum sounds and things like that well yeah like setting up a template um, is a really good idea so a template in a digital audio workstation is basically where you set up a session and it's a starting place um, so you, a template can be anything you want, um, from a completely empty session to having a bunch of tracks with uh, amp simulators on them and you know a, a great drum uh, preset sound up that you like and stuff like that. And you start from there and you pull it up and it's just all kind of ready to go and you plug in and just start creating. So my templates have um, generally a Steven Slate um, a drum kit up on one track. Uh, spread across you know a bunch of faders like I said earlier where I've got the kick and the snare and the toms and all that stuff isolated on separate tracks uh, so I've got all that going I've also got stylus which is a um, another sort of percussion drum instrument um, and I've, I've got that going uh, so that I can add like things like you know a little loop or tambourine or something like that very easily to a session um, so that's open and ready to go I've got two bass channels ready to go in my template and one has a clean bass amp simulator on it and the other one has some distortion so that I can kind of blend like a clean and distorted amp signal. Um, what else? What else? Uh, and then I've got some guitar tracks open in my templates generally that have like already some own hammer uh, impulse responses ready to go. Uh, so that if I want to just uh, take a direct out of my uh, surreactive load, like plug an amp into my surreactive load, output of that into my interface, 
I've already got like a cabinet sim up on a channel and I can just start working. Um, guys, somebody's like outside here making a bunch of noise. I'm really sorry. That always happens when I do this. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some of my templates I might have sort of more geared towards um, mic'd cabinet sounds. So I might have a, a, a fader ready to go that is sort of labeled like 57 dynamic or something and then the other one will be like you know ribbon mic or whatever and I've got those assigned to certain channels that correspond with outputs of my audio interface um, so all I got to do is set up a couple of mics real quick arm the tracks and in theory everything's ready to go and record so it's, it's really just up to you and your studio and how your workflow uh, is but you want to you want to set it up um, so that it's really easy to get creative really quickly that's the, the best thing that I can say. Um, so if the problem that you're having is mainly with drums, I would say go through and make, you know, if you use addictive drums or easy drum or Steven Slate drums, whatever, um, get a great sounding drum kit going and just make it sound super cool. You know, um, set up faders so that there's a little bit of EQ and compression on every fader and get a great starting place. And then store that as a template and then every time you you know, want to write a new song or, or go to work on whatever you're working on, you'll pull that up and it'll just be rocking. You'll be ready to go and you should be, you know, not so sort of creatively uh, uh, hindered. Matt Watson asks, if I had a few hours a day to practice, like three or four hours, and I didn't have anything to prepare for in particular, like a, you know, session or something like that, or a, uh, uh, you know, tour or anything where I'm learning songs, what would I practice? Like, what would I do with three or four hours of time? Um, well, I would probably. Oh, he also says uh, no YouTube. De oh, no YouTube demos to tape, right? But I would have access to YouTube. Okay, because what I was going to say was I might look on YouTube and look for something fun to practice because that's such a great tool these days. Um, I'm pretty like all over the map when it comes to practice. I get on little binges and kicks where it's like you know I want to sit down and play along to jam tracks and just work on improvising. Or, you know, other times I'll like, hey, I want to learn some new Travis picking stuff, finger picking on acoustic guitar or something. Then I'm off on that. And, and uh, so it just depends. I mean, everybody's different, you know. Um, I would say these days, the thing that I would most like to sit and practice is actually improvising um, so that I can just sort of flow with ideas off the top of my head easier. So that would be the thing, you know, maybe and maybe learning some uh, like Jam Track Central has a whole bunch of great lessons um, where you can, you know, download these. I've, I've done some for them as well, but I'd love to work on some of like the Martin Miller ones and, and things like that where you can download these tracks, learn some of these guys' licks, and then there's also a jam track included with the lesson. You can sit there and play their licks or improvise other stuff over top of them. Just stuff like that, really. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, I don't find a lot of time to actually really do stuff like that these days. If I'm generally working, so it's like, and I, to be honest, it's like rather than sit and practice and sort of noodle, it's fun for me to work on the demos and things like that because I'm always writing. So that's kind of practice to me anyway. Like when I'm coming up with these tracks for my video demos, uh, I'm writing and sort of producing and, and, you know, doing all those things. And that's, that's like an all-encompassing kind of thing. Like, for example, I really enjoy playing bass these days. Um, it's challenging to me and it's like a, a just really fun and kind of different. I haven't played a lot of bass guitar in my career or anything, but I love sitting there and coming up with bass parts for those demos and it's kind of, you know, thinking about the music differently or something than I have in the past just playing guitar. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's much of an answer, but I guess, um, I guess my answer would be I'd, I'd do some improvising and then do some writing basically if I had three or four hours. Okay, Chuck Nowakowski sort of asks a, uh, a related question. He asks, uh, what would I suggest if there's somebody that knows uh, all the pentatonics, been playing for a year or so, he knows m m some major scales, major and minor arpeggios, uh, and a couple of songs, but he wants to be able to improvise better, and he's not sure if it's better to learn more songs to get more knowledge or put on a backing track and flounder around a bit until he starts figuring things out a little. I wouldn't suggest just floundering around. I think it's kind of a waste of time. Um, I would say, yeah, if you only know a couple tunes, yeah, keep learning like people's songs and licks and stuff and learn because every time you learn a new song and you kind of uh, try and internalize the solo or licks that are in there, you're getting phrasing ideas and melodic ideas and you're kind of doing things that you might not normally do if you just sit there and kind of flounder over backing tracks. Yeah, so it's, you know, learning people's uh, 
uh, uh, solos, you know, like the great, sit there and learn some David Gilmore or some, you know, really cool Jimmy Page solos or uh, if you're into rock, if you're into another style, you know, pick up a great player in that style and uh, learn um, learn some, some, some of your favorite, you know, classic riffs that are like, wow, that's really cool. I'd love to know how to play that. Well, learn it and internalize it, get it under your fingers, go, oh, I see how they're doing that, you know, and then maybe put on a backing track and see if you can make some of those licks work or variations of them work. And that's sort of how you develop your own style, really. Beyond that, I would say, um, yeah, if you know scales and, you know, arpeggios is kind of a cool thing to sit there and work on over backing tracks, like really nailing all the, um, the you know, the notes of a chord so that if, it, if there's a, ch you know, a change going by, let's say it's going B minor to E minor, so you're like, you know, just going like, and then the E minor. You know, playing like like a you know E minor seven sort of arpeggios and trying to kind of nail the target note so that, and when you go back to B, and back to E, you know, uh, kind of nailing the nailing the target notes and things. I hope you can hear that. I know it's like not plugged in, um, but yeah, kind of kind of just sitting and knowing where the you know. in B minor and then in E, maybe in the same position, and, and working on where all those target notes, the arpeggio notes are, so that um, you really know where to resolve your licks when you're you know, uh, improvising and stuff like that over progressions. Okay, last question for today. Really interesting question uh, from a fellow named Jed, and he says he wants to know about different single coil pickups. Um, he says he wants to know the difference between like uh, tele style pickups, P90s, uh, and Strat style pickups. Uh, basically, he says tele pickups seem to be a little bit hotter than Strat pickups. That's correct, generally, I would say. Not always, but um, many of them are, yeah. And he says he's always played a Strat, and then he's looking to get a guitar with either P90s or humbuckers to get more classic rock sounds. And it seems that most classic rock players use humbuckers. Uh, well, you know, Hendrix. Um, Richie Blackmore, um, a lot of people use strats. Uh, yeah, so a telly is, is a kind of a cool animal because they're kind of, they're hotter, you're right, like in many cases, and it's because of the design of the pickups and stuff. There's a great article that was written a while ago in Premier Guitar that maybe you can seek out. If you Google search Premier Guitar, you know, Telecaster pickups, you'll probably find the article I'm talking about. I think it might have been a two-parter. Um, that dealt with all the different eras of tele pickups, like from the sort of, you know, very late 40s, early broadcaster pickups through the early 50s, mid 50s, the 60s, and how they kind of changed. Um, some of those early 50s ones were like super hot, um, relatively speaking, and they have kind of a different sound. Um, but yeah, tele can be a real cool thing for rock and roll, actually, because it is kind of a fat sound almost on its way to maybe a P90 type thing. Now, P90s have their own kind of rude, you know, brash like thing and yet they're still single coils. So I generally think of P90s as just being like, you know, single coil but fat. Fat and kind of loud and kind of raw. And uh, tellies as being, you know, fat but with more twang. And uh, strats as being the thinnest of them all but um, maybe with the most pleasing sound uh, when you're using the neck pickup and the in-between kind of positions on a strat are of course really cool too. Uh, but the, the sort of maybe the lack of output and just the design of a Strat pickup and the neck really lended itself towards those beautiful fluty kind of, you know, uh, uh, Hendrixy tones. Um, Tele neck pickups are sort of not as uh, uh, highly regarded as Strats, that's for sure. And P90s sound great in the neck, but also, yeah, I think, when I think P90, I think of, you know, Leslie West or something like Les Paul Jr., Bridge you know, that kind of raw rock and roll thing, whereas strats, you know, on the bridge can be a little bright and piercing, can still sound great, but you kind of got to EQ your amp for it, right? And they just don't have as much balls and power. Um, so different strokes, you know, just depends what you want. Um, in the Thornbucker humbuckers, that's, got, we were kind of going for a, uh, you know, like a, almost some qualities of single coil, which is what I believe that uh, some of the best early sort of PAFs had, the lower output uh, PAFs had a real clarity to them. They weren't worlds apart from, from P90s, I don't think. 
uh, in tone. Humbuckers, as time went on, they kind of you know, started making them more and more powerful. And when the coils are perfectly matched, they can kind of have a slightly darker sort of quality to, quality to them that gives them sort of what we think of as modern humbuckers, like a kind of a, almost like a lot of mid range and not necessarily a lot of top end clarity. Sound great, like dirty for soloing and stuff, but try and get some clean sounds out of them and sort of uninspiring. Um, so yeah, with the Thornbuckers, we were going for that sort of unbalanced coil, like early uh, PAF thing that almost mimics some qualities of single coil, like still a lot of that mojo and clarity without being bright and piercing. So a little plug for my own pickups there. Check out the Thornbuckers if you want to check out, uh, you know, some humbuckers that might still not be worlds apart from single coils. Uh, yeah, all right, well that's it for this video, for this week. Sorry I'm putting it out so late tonight. I, I was working on a, a video demo and I actually almost forgot to do this. Uh, but I'm like, okay, let's get it done. So it's almost 9 p.m. on the West Coast, but I'm gonna just uh, uh, bounce this out real quick and upload it to my YouTube now. So thanks for joining me and thanks for asking me all the questions. You've been sending me these great questions to my Facebook page. I'm way behind on them at this point, but I'll try and get to all of them eventually. Hit subscribe if you haven't. Come back and see me for more videos real soon. I really appreciate it. And I am Pete Thorne. Over and out.